Thank you, everyone, for being here. That was a wonderful introduction. Should I tell the microphone story? You can, you can. Okay, so the reason how this came to pass, we were presenting, Dr. Bouchard and I were presenting with other presenters on a panel at the Wisconsin <laughs> Science Festival. You guys were there. And um, we had a microphone trouble between the two of us. I mean, one of our microphones wasn't working. So we were trying to share the microphone. And remember, the technician person was all upset. He came below us. We were on this kind of on this podium, and he goes, "You can't share the microphone. They're they're like like synced for your special voice." We so were like, "Oh." <laughs> so then we started chatting, and lo and behold, this all came to pass. So you go because it's over a microphone. So <laughs> that's why you're all here. So thanks for being here. I've been asked to share. Um, a climate literacy model that we call Ginkinu Anji Waban, Ginkinu Wiziwe Anji Waban, which means guiding for tomorrow. It's a title that was given to us by an Ojibwe tribal elder, Mr. Jim St. Arnold. And you'll, uh, I can tell you that when we first got the name for the project and the initiative, I said, wouldn't you want to give us a name like about weather or rain or sun? He goes, guiding for tomorrow is the name for this. And actually, I have to correct my, my, my statement. We really started this way back. It was almost 2006 and 7. Our first actual um, outreach of the project was 2010. So way back then, um, he said, this is going to be something that's going to be important that's going to go all over the place. So it's going to help guide for tomorrow. So I hope it, it gives you some of, that, uh, some of that feeling and some of that um, knowledge, because I'm not going to be so much sharing about climate change as a science, but more about communicating about climate change and other sciences, using the GUA model as an example and the framework that it's set up upon. So I, I, when I was asked to give some kind of introductory statement about our program here, I said that this is going to be a polar bear, bear free program. <laughs> Not that polar bears aren't being affected by climate change, but one of the reasons why is going to become evident to you, especially when we talk about the model. Polar bears are kind of out of sight and out of mind for a lot of people when we talk about climate change. They don't necessarily resonate with people on a day-to-day -day basis. They may value them kind of in a, in a remote way. But we're going to be talking about place-based evidence of climate change and place-based evidence uh, in science communication and how that makes science come alive to audiences. So I'm hoping that what, I, what I'm going to talk about in the communication framework that GWA is based on is going to give you some, some ideas for being, uh, making your science communication more effective as well. So let me introduce the project partners. Um, we have the um, National Park Service, the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service, Shawamaganikali National Forest, the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Is anybody familiar with Glyphwick, as we call them? Glyphwick, some folks are. Okay, Glyphwick, and that's how I'll refer to it because Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission is a really long word to say. Glyphwick represents the 11 Ojibwa Indian tribes in this, what we call the ceded territory, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, northern Michigan, homelands of the Ojibwa that were ceded to the U.S. government uh, back in the 1800s with the native people keeping the rights to hunt, fish, and gather on those territories. So we have reservation lands, but we also have the ceded territory, which is much larger. Glyphwick helps to administer off-reservation treaty rights, public education, research on those lands in partnership with the 11 Ojibwa tribes. UW Extension, who I work for, and a couple other people in this room do too, and the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, where the project has been based out of. Like any big project like this, there's been lots of people that have supported us, and I just put a few down for some of the major ones. Some of our major funders here that have provided both technical information and funding, as well as others that have provided technical information, particularly the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, USDA Forest Service in Houghton Hancock, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts that you're probably all familiar with, based right here at the Nelson Institute, Bad River Tribe, and the Red Cliff Tribe of the Lake Superior Ojibwa. So let's do a little bit of project location. Some of you might be really familiar with, with where I'm speaking. We are located in northern Wisconsin. Whoops, back here. I touched the board. See, I did yes, that. Yes, my board. Okay, back there. Don't touch it. Okay, so you can see the colored areas are the ceded territories, and the dates are when those those territories where those lands were ceded to the U.S. government. So where the project is located in the heart of Ojibwa Indian Country, including the ceded territories, the project is based in Ashland, Wisconsin. Here's my accent, by the way, Ashland. And that's what it looks like. Anybody been to the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center? Oh, pretty much. Okay, good. Good. All right. Okay, so our project roots, kind of about 2007-ish or so, 
um, our land management agencies, the federal agencies, the Park Service and Forest Service, were realizing that something was happening, climate was changing, things were changing, environmental variables were changing in the region, and it was starting to affect the communities and the economies of the area, but in particular, public safety. For example, the National Park Service at the Apostle Islands were finding that that fluctuating water levels on Lake Superior were making it unsafe for people to use docks, use the Park Service docks to get on and off their boats. Glyphwick was concerned about climate change impacts to Ojibwa treaty rights and their rights to hunt, fish, and gather. Uh, because if climate change is affecting the species that are used to hunt, fish, and gather, that's certainly going to affect treaty rights, right? All right, so we had evidences of these extreme storm events. Some of you might be familiar with the big flood up north of 2016, which has washed out most of our infrastructure, which has still not been fixed and may never be fixed. Loss of wild rice in the Bad River Kakagan Sloughs. These, this is a, about a 15,000 acre freshwater estuary within the Bad River Reservation, where the wild rice that grows for the Bad River Tribe is located. So the loss of wild rice. And as an educator, I was finding that our traditional models of climate change education, even the ones we were using with extension, as good as we are, were simply just not resonating with people. It was so science-based, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the tech transfer of science was making a lot of people just kind of glaze over in their eyes. It just was not working. So our goal was to create a climate literacy model, if you want to call it that, that would increase people's awareness of climate change so they would do something about it. Awareness, action. You're going to hear me say this many, many times. And here we are way back when. This was probably taken about 2010. This is our diverse project team. There were many others, of course. We came together, the Glyphwick, the two federal agencies, Extension, came together to come up with a strategy to do this. So we, of course, being a good Extension educator, I looked for some research basis to help us form the framework of our uh, Ginkanu Wizziway Anji Waban, which we call GWAW for short, for obvious reasons. Okay, and we found some interesting uh, uh, research from Columbia University that, base, that says basically local place-based evidence of climate change gained through experiential learning is as or more effective than simply stating analytical climate change data to increasing climate literacy. This makes sense, doesn't it? It's not rocket science. If it's something that you can see and observe, it's going to make more sense to you than, than maybe a, a lot of numbers put at you or, or charts put at you. And so we use this really as the basis for the GWAL model. And this little cartoon, the guy says, burying my head in the sand over climate change is much easier now half the world's turned to desert, place-based evidence. All right, so we had to come up with some key guiding principles for us as a planning team. And this is what they, this is what they were. Remember, this is back in 2006, 7-ish or so, with federal agencies involved. Climate change is real. We all agreed that that would be one of our guiding principles. Weather and climate are different. Everybody understands the difference between weather and climate, right? Okay, weather, mm, windy outside today. You know, measured by temperature, barometers, wind gauges, things like that. Climate change, or climate is measured statistically over long periods of time. Important to know because we can have weather variability, up and down, seasonal, daily, etc. But we measure climate over long periods of time. Climate affects culture. And here is Mr. St. Arnold, our elder that gave us the GWAL term. He's demonstrating the cultural, the Ojibwa cultural practice of birch bark harvesting. Birch bark harvesting depends on the sustainability of what species? Paper birch, right? Okay, a species that likes cool to cold boreal forest conditions. Can grow other places, this is what it prefers. If we take a look at what's happening to birch bark harvesting in our Ojibwa communities, where elder trees are no longer getting harder and harder to find for making canoes, uh, Mr. Marvin Defoe, a Red Cliff tribal member, reports this place-based evidence to us. We also see birch trees dying up north. Many of you have observed this. Uh, if we look at projected change in Wisconsin's average annual temperature to mid-century with a middle-of-the-road climate scenario, kind of we just keep doing what we're doing. We don't get our act together to reduce carbon emissions. We don't increase them anymore. Just kind of middle-of-the-road. In our northern Wisconsin, we're projected to go up between 6 to maybe uh, 8 degrees. What would this mean for the sustainability of paper birch, a tree that relies on cool to cold temperatures? What does this mean to this cultural practice of birch bark harvesting? Okay, this is climate is affecting culture. This is how we're linking the two. This is the stumbling, 
This is a stumbling block to many people. Humans contribute to climate change, and I'm not going to argue with you one way or the other. This is what we accepted, because then if we accept this, we can do something about it. We're not powerless. So those were the guiding principles that we as a team um, accepted to put together this model. So let's talk a little bit about the framework now, not so much about the science. Okay, GWO uses what's called an interpretive uh, framework to build climate change awareness. Some of you may be familiar with principles of interpretation. Interpretation is a highly effective form of communication that can make a topic or issue come alive by revealing messages and relationships to an audience. And it can be really used in any field or capacity in a lot of different formats. It can be used on interpretive signs, it can be used, this happens to be our GWO website which is set up with that framework. Park naturalists use it. You can use it as science educators. So interpretation, instead of translation of facts, or we think of interpretation as somebody speaks Spanish and somebody interprets to you, you know, they're giving you, they're giving you word for word interpretation. We're speaking of interpretation in a different way. We're talking about revealing deeper meanings, relationships, connections, and action when we talk about interpretation. And this really kind of got started uh, by several people in the National Park Service. It doesn't really have roots within our National Park Service connection to the GWO project, but actually interpretation started and is kind of epitomized by Freeman Tilden, this guy here. And he said through interpretation, understanding, through interpretation, understanding, through uh, appreciation, through appreciation, protection of national parks and other historical sites. That's what interpretation was started. Again, awareness building and action via protection. His book, Interpreting Our Heritage, is kind of the Bible for interpretation, if you want to take a look at that. Again, it spells out all of the principles in more detail that I'll cover here. Let's just take a look at these principles briefly. And these are from his seminal work from 1957. Okay, the first principle of interpretation is that your message must relate to the person's experience that you're speaking of. Otherwise, your message will be sterile to them. It has to relate to, some, to them, to something that they value, right? If we don't, again, back to the polar bear thing. This is why this is a polar bear free program. We want to relate climate change to something that you value, okay? Personally, that makes a difference to you. And that's what GWO does, as you'll see in a second. I have many examples for you. So it's the revelation of information, not the tech transfer of information that many of our science communication models have been based on in the past. Okay, so GWO reveals climate change not so much just on scientific data, but actually through observable place-based evidence of its impact on species and habitats that support the valued uh, cultural or economic practice that resonates with that person. Okay? So it reveals this. People don't always think of it that way. It's like, wow, they'll say, gee, I never thought of it. You want to reveal kind of the aha moment that you've kind of captured their imagination, or you've captured their, opened their mind a little bit differently. Okay, it must present a whole story and not just pieces. And my way of explaining this is by creating a whole, and I always use my hands like we're creating a whole, is that we link place-based evidence of climate change with climate research, linking culture and climate together. And I just use that funny example of trying to, people trying to explain an elephant that are, that, that's blindfolded. We try to explain climate change through a cultural and scientific context that's integrated together, which is kind of unique. This is a little provocative. So the chief goal of interpretive messaging is not just to instruct, not just to, but we want to provoke people in a good way to do something. So the GWO model, as you see, first builds awareness of climate change, then promotes and calls for action to do something. And finally, interpretation is an art that combines many other arts, and as I mentioned before, can be transferred to different cultures and locations. And the way you put together your messaging is going to be the art that you kind of stir into that recipe using these principles. The recipe will be yours to create and tweak. That's the art here. Okay, so how does it come alive? How do we make GWAL, the model, come alive to audiences? By revealing how climate change is affecting the sustainability of species and habitats. This is important because this is the key element that links place-based evidence with climate science, the sustainability of species and, and habitats, that support a cultural practice or an economic practice that people value, that's important to them, by integrating evidence that they can observe, that they can see themselves and evaluate for themselves with climate science to provoke action. So obviously, brook trout fishing 
That cultural practice that many of you may value relies on the sustainability of what? Did I just change this thing again? Oh, what? Don't touch this thing. Uh, a brook trout, okay. <laughs> and we'll take a look at this model. All right. Another interesting piece that the GWAL model adds to the place-based mix is that we use the cultural practices of the Lake Superior Ojibwa and climate impacts on them as an indicator to help us evaluate place-based uh, evidence. Why do we do this? Okay, not only because Glyphwick is a partner with us, but because the Ojibwa people have relied on the sustainability of, of species uh, and plant and animal species for generations to support cultural practices, lifeways, subsistence, spiritual practices, cultural practices, wild racing done hundreds of years ago is the same as wild racing done today. Okay? There's that knowledge. There's that knowledge of the species and the knowledge of change. So that's called traditional ecological knowledge. Indigenous cultures have this because they have been in environments so much longer than many of our Anglo um, uh, uh, cultures. So they have this knowledge passed down through oral traditions and also language that provides long-term place-based indicators of climate change beyond weather variability. So remember the issue of weather variability, seasonal? You know, remember the senator that brought the snowball into the, the Congress and said, see, it can't be climate change, there's a snowball from outside? Well, weather variability. So the issue with place-based evidence is sometimes with our cultures that have not been on the land as long, we may be actually seeing weather variability and not climate change. But if we can take a look at what an indigenous culture is saying through their experiences, their long-term traditional ecological knowledge, we can get a baseline for evaluating place-based evidence that we are observing. That makes sense? Okay, so this is a way that we really help to improve our ability to evaluate place-based evidence. And there is, there is research on this, and it comes from Newfoundland. Uh, researchers, these guys here, Finnis and Stoddard, um, they did a study that was looked in 2015 that looked at Stephenville, Newfoundland, where uh, Anglo culture thought for sure that they were having climate impacts. And they had probably started observing maybe 10, 15 years earlier. And the researchers surveyed them and they found, and they surveyed what was happening with climate. And they found actually that the residents were, what they were experiencing was weather variability, not climate change. So again, we need to use caution. There's challenges with using place-based evidence. But if we, can, if we can kind of ground truth it with a baseline, like with using traditional ecological knowledge, or a language component that has been uh, used for centuries in the language in the Ojibwe language or other indigenous languages, we then can help ground truth the place-based evidence that we're seeing. Are, is everyone familiar with traditional ecological knowledge to some degree? So it tends to be qualitative. It's based on people that are using the land, hunters, fishers, gatherers. It's over a long period of time. Okay, so just as the people that I demonstrated, the, the wild ricers from maybe generations and generations ago, know where the wild rice is, when it is right, um, those words are encased in the language for etc. They know this through these ecological observations that they make, tend to be long term. And the success of their, of their hunt, fishing and gathering depends on those observations and the validity of them. Scientific observations can be quantitative, so typically made by a smaller group of people, might be uh, at one point of time, or samples from different places over a shorter period of time. Different way of knowing, so it lacks a long-term perspective of traditional ecological knowledge. Everyone, anyone familiar with Robin Kiminer, Braiding Sweetgrass? A wonderful book that talks about the integration of TEK and scientific knowledge. Uh, a woman, uh, Robin is a, a Potawatomi woman and elder, and also a PhD botanist at SUNY College. And this is a, I would highly recommend this book to get a perspective of how these two ways of knowing can be braided together like you would braid sweetgrass to give us a more robust understanding of, of scientific issues such as climate change. There are other groups that are working on the same nationally and internationally. I just came back from Rising Voices Indigenous Climate Change Conference sponsored by um, the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the University Corporation for Natural Resource, uh, funded by the National Science Foundation. So this is no small organization. This is an international organization of indigenous climate scientists with Western climate scientists that are integrating traditional knowledges and Western knowledges in order to find uh, culturally relevant climate mitigation and adaptation strategies. So we have national 
focus on this right now. And it was, it's, very, it's very good to go there because it, 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 it uh, channels uh, perfectly our GWAL initiative. Okay, so the qualitative sources that we use. So the place-based sources we use are people's observations based up with TEK observations from Native people, Indigenous cultures. We use qualitative sources from vetted sources, from peer-reviewed sources, like the wiki maps that you'll see several of that I'm going to share, climate projections from NASA we have included in our, in our resources and model, and again, we use that middle-of-the-road climate scenario. Okay, kind of everything stays pretty static. Some scientists would argue we've already surpassed the middle-of-the-road climate scenario, that we already bumped over it, but for argument purposes, in this day, kind of in a more moderate level, we're going to say middle-of-the-road climate scenario. Okay, let's just take a look at how Wisconsin's climate is changing. And you can kind of reflect on things that you like to do and how things might be changing for you. We have had, this is qualitative evidence that we can observe. So we know that through our, what the elders have told us in the Ojibwe culture is we've had unprecedented cancellations and disruptions of the wild rice harvests based on traditional ecological knowledge. I have also been told that based on language, the month for wild rice harvesting, Manumanake Gisis, forgive me, I'm not a native speaker if anyone is here who is, does not sync up with when wild rice is being harvested anymore. And, and there's more research being done by Glyphwick. They have a researcher actually interviewing elders now within that ceded territory, that big region of northern, the three northern states, to gather traditional ecological knowledge and codify it to evaluate climate change impacts used on a research traditional ecological knowledge. But here are two examples. We also see that Bayfield, in Bayfield, this is long term, 150 years of ice data at the ice road that goes from Bayfield to Madeline Island. We are losing about three days a decade. And except for this, this year where we have an ice road, there has not been an ice road for the last couple of years, or the time period has gotten shorter and shorter. When people can drive over the ice, or they have to take the ferry boat. And we've had more and more extreme storm events in the area. There's phenological evidence as well. Aldo Leopold, daughter Nina Leopold, 60 years of phenological evidence. You can just, I won't talk about all these things, but you can take a look at what's happening here. Spring is arriving earlier. The growing season has lengthened between 5 to 20 days across the state of Wisconsin, the greatest change in northwestern Wisconsin, where our project is located. USDA plant hardiness. If anybody's a gardener, check out your Young's catalog and the map in there. Hardly, USDA is hardly a radical environmental climate change group, right? Okay, they provide the information to the farmers on planting. Take a look at where we have moved in how many years? We've gone from zone 3B to zone 4. It's not to say that we're going to be growing coconuts in northern Wisconsin, but it is a different growing zone. We have warmed by one whole growing zone. So what are the possible benefits? What are some of the issues involved in this? All right, so we have also our scientific information that we're using in the GWA model. We use historical scientific evidence that's already been reported of how Wisconsin's average temperatures are changing. And we use information, climate projections from sources like Wiki, Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. And here are some of the, the um, scenarios that they're providing. Overall warming in the state of Wisconsin, warming winters, and that's a little difficult to see with the lighting in here, but warming winters, especially in northern Wisconsin, frequency of cold nights will decrease by about 20-some days. And more extreme weather events. Um, let me just go back. The precipitation maps are not as definitive, but what's really definitive is the increase in storm events. Place-based evidence that I shared with you already of increased storm events. We're really going to see it more in the northern Wisconsin area, the Lake Spirit Basin here, and over towards the Green Bay area. All right, so climate is going to be affecting, there's going to be winners and losers in climate change. And it's going to affect the habitat conditions that species depend on to thrive and survive. And we depend on these species for the cultural practices and economic practices that we value. All right, let's take a look at, let's take a look at the GWAM. I'm going to take this slide first of all, and then we'll go to the schematic of it. Okay, so I'm going to present this first of all in a horizontal, a vertical model, sorry, and then I'm going to present it in a horizontal model. But it's easier to explain this way first of all. So let's take a look at wild racing. So wild racing is an important cultural practice to the Lake Superior Ojibwa. In fact, is the stories that I have been told, the migration story of the Ojibwa, the reason why uh, they are in the Lake Superior region. They migrated from the eastern seaboard to find a place where food grows on the water. 
Manumen, meaning the good berry or wild rice. Very important food, not only for subsistence, for spirit, spiritual practices, for ceremonial practices. An elder related to me, it would be like our communion wafers. It's that important. But it's also used as food. And it's kind of a superfood. If you have not had wild rice processed na by natives, uh, native processed uh, rice, it's absolutely delicious. Much different than our Uncle Ben's wild rice that we might have. <laughs> so, obviously, the harvesting of wild rice depends on the sustainability of manumen, wild rice. And what does manumen depend on to thrive and survive? It needs shallow water habitats, moderate level water fluctuations. It's an aquatic grass that grows from the substrate of streams and lakes. And actually when it's young and it's growing underwater, it can, it can breathe oxygen underwater. But then it gets to floating leaf stage where its leaves float on the water. That's about mm, late May, early June. And it, goes, it undergoes a physiological change where it actually begins to stand up right as a plant and breathe atmospheric oxygen, kind of like we do. Like people. So, in that floating leaf stage, it's extremely susceptible to being drowned by gusher rain events um, or it could be swept away at any time. A flood can sweep the wild rice away. And it likes cool growing season conditions. We talked a little bit about this. Do culture and science agree that climate change is affecting the sustainability of Benumen? We've talked about these disruptions before, and we've talked about the change that the language is signifying or suggesting. We have place-based evidence of change also in the variables that affect the habitat conditions that Manuma needs to thrive and survive. We're going to see more heat, we're going to see more drought, and more gusher rain events. What does this mean for the sustainability of Manuma, of wild rice, or the cultural practice of wild rice harvesting? If you were a wild rice harvester, would this make you become a little bit more aware of climate change? Okay. So let's put this in the GWA model. So I'm going to put this now in, the, in, this, in this, um, this horizontal model. Because what, I'm going to give you a number of examples to kind of show you how you can use this, how you can apply this kind of the art, of, the art part of interpretation using this model. Cultural practice, wild rice harvesting, key species, what it needs. Place-based evidence, I just happen to choose flooding here. I could have chosen some of the others, and integrated with the climate science, the variables that will affect the habitat conditions that wild rice needs to thrive and survive. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, any questions? We're going to go through a bunch of examples. Some of them are going to be kind of fun ones. All right, let's take a look at another one. Okay, cultural practice. What is it? Maple syrup. Yeah, maple, maple syrup. syrup. Or maybe you just like to eat pancakes with maple syrup on, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, key species that it needs? Maybe. Maple. Sugar. Yeah, sugar maple. Requiring cool spring mm -hmm. nights for sap production and, qu and quality. What are we seeing? Any of you, anybody maple syrup harvester here? Have you noticed? What do you, what have you noticed? It sometimes comes earlier. Comes earlier? Yeah. It's and, and it gets disrupted if that cold night, warm right. day thing gets disrupted. Right, exactly. That's what's been reported to me. Also, from Ojibwe people that I speak with, disruptions that they have not seen before in their knowledge base. And again, I threw up the same old map. This, oh, actually, this is the spring temperature map. A little harder to see. I hope you can see that this temperature bar in here increases in spring temperatures, which, of course, will affect the maple syrup harvest because it requires colder temperatures, also not only for sap production, but also quality of the production. What does this mean for the cultural or economic practice of maple sugaring? We could have also used the map of drought or high heat, which will stress maple trees. Let's take another one. Okay, this one we alluded to before. Trout. Trout, yeah. Fly fishing, key species, brook trout or brown trout, requires cold habitats with high oxygen levels. Anybody a trout fisherman that can report any place-based evidence? Trout fishermen are reporting some, in some cases in warmer summer streams drying, but also much higher stream temperatures, much lower bag acryl, acryl that they have of trout because of that. If we take a look in Wisconsin, this particular map is summer temperature, average projected change in summer temperatures by mid-century northern Wisconsin here, this area where we are, about six and a half degrees over most of the state. That looks like about five and a half to me, doesn't it, to you? We have found out that we found through projections through Wisconsin Initiative about climate impacts, climate models predict that we could lose about 95% of our brook trout streams if we warm just over 5 degrees, average annual summer temperatures. Looks like we're going to make that, huh? Yeah, and actually the place-based evidence is supporting that this is happening. Take a look at a couple more here, though. All right, here's an interesting one. So, 
I had an instructor from South Milwaukee High School say, can you help me use the GWO model to make climate change come alive to my high school students? So I said, well, what do they like to do? You don't go outside, bike, what, in the city? They like to eat perch fish fries. Really? That's interesting. <laughs> OK, so perch fish fries, let's do it. What do, what do we need for perch fish fries? Perch. perch, yeah. OK, so we need perch. So perch, like cool waters, it's not a cold water species. Warmer waters favor invasives that compete with yellow perch. So I said, what's place-based evidence that you're seeing? Do the kids go out and fish? No, they don't fish at all, though. No, what they're seeing, they are seeing higher prices for perch fish fry, and this is local perch, locally caught fish, because the supply is diminished, because the, the fishermen are not bringing in as many yellow perch. Okay, and if we take a look, of course, at projections for temperature change in the, in the Lake Michigan area, near the Milwaukee area, of course, it's expected to increase. What will that mean, mean for the sustainability of yellow perch? They might be stressed a little bit more. Does it, will it impact the perch fish fries? Yeah, probably. It's a way of getting these students to think of climate change in a different way, right? Kind of a fun example. Here's another fun example. And actually, I think this was a lady that was on one of our panels. It was on the yeah, was Yes. So this, I forget her name, but she's a researcher. Do you remember her name? OK, she's a researcher doing research on mosquitoes and vector-borne illnesses. You can put ticks in this model, too. They work really well. So cultural practice, maybe taking students for a hike. Maybe you like to go out in the woods. We have our key species is our Wisconsin state bird. The mosquito, of course, requires water for breeding. Warmer temperatures encourage rapid generational development. Place-based evidence, are we seeing more mosquitoes? We are certainly up north. Um, I don't have any traditional ecological knowledge to base on that, but again, we take a look at those projected annual, annual changes and what was um, temperature changes in Wisconsin. It's very interesting to hear her speak about what how this might affect, climate change might affect mosquitoes. She said the future is really unclear. The warmer temperatures are supporting new species carrying West Nile and Zika virus. Zika virus in Wisconsin? Uh, but the heavy precipitation, these gusher rain events, may also sweep, disrupt life cycles, sweep away populations, but wetter environments also create new breeding habitats. Here's an example from Florida. Okay, a different way of using the model. So I'm going to give you a bunch of these kind of fun ones. You can just see how you, the, you can use cre you can be creative with this model. Cultural practice of hiking in the Everglades, not. Because, as reported by this naturalist, the evidence or the existence of invasive Bernese white pythons. Yikes. So I'm sure you've all heard about this issue and the, the, the environmental damage these are causing. So I said, what are you, what is place-based evidence that you are seeing? So the naturalist reported to me, this was a phone call, a webinar I was doing, she said, we are seeing more and more of these snakes on the trails and we can't take our students out. We're afraid to take them out. I happened to find a map of evidence, place-based evidence, of where 50 or more pythons have been captured. And if we take a look at, we don't have to be Florida climate scientists, if it's getting warmer and moister in Wisconsin, you can imagine what's happening in Florida. So I said to her, I said, what do you think this means for the sustainability of the Bernese white python? And she had never thought about it before. She goes, Oh my gosh, there's going to be more. It's going to favor. Climate change will favor them. I said, yes, they're going to be a winner. How will this affect their cultural practice of uh, taking the kids out? Or maybe even ecotourism in the Everglades area. Would this make climate change come alive to you? The snakes would, if nothing else, yeah. OK, let's take a look at another one. This is a non-species way of using the model. So we're going to do some fun ones. Cultural practice. Anybody do this? Snowboarding, skiing? Yeah, OK. What is the habitat that you need? There's no species involved in this one. What's the habitat you need? Snow. snow. OK. So what do you need for snow? Cold. Yeah, cold temperatures. So if we look at place-based and scientific evidence, I was assistant manager of a ski area in northern Wisconsin in big snow country, blackjack ski area. Some of you may ski there. We put in snowmaking in the 1980s because our snow off Lake Superior was unreliable. We really didn't put two and two, or I didn't put two and two together at that point, but what we were seeing already was the beginnings of, of climate issues with, with our snowpack. We were getting more rain, more thunderstorms in January and through February, and so we had place-based evidence has continued, and some of you, in your own experience with skiing, have you noticed differences in your snow conditions, snowboarding? Yes. And if we take a look again at projected changes, winter changes in Wisconsin, we are expected to warm up about nine degrees in northern Wisconsin. What will this mean for cultural practices or economic practices that rely on snow? That we might even say could be snowmobiling. Okay? Snowmobiling. Trees. Big, yeah. Big industry for our county, Iron County, where I live, northern Wisconsin, snowmobiling. Also skiing. 
So what does this mean for these cultural practices that you might enjoy or might be really important for the economy of your communities? Would this make climate change come alive to you? Here's an economic practice, non-species dependent. This is winter logging. Now I've worked with this example with a lot of our quite conservative loggers up north, and this resonates with them. Again, the habitat that they need is cold weather to freeze roads, to get these big logging trucks full of logs through the woods without breaking through the, the, this, uh, the ground cover. And I said, what kind of place-based evidence are you seeing of change? They said, we are seeing more of our skidders and trucks be dropping through the ground because the ground isn't frozen solid enough. So place-based evidence there. If we take a look at changes in frequency of cold nights in northern Wisconsin, we're going to lose about 20-some cold nights in northern Wisconsin. What does that mean? Fewer colder nights, less frozen ground, less ability for these loggers to, to get their product out of the woods, which affects their pocketbook. And we have even a quote from a logger that had been an extend, had worked for over 60 years, and he's lost about almost six weeks of winter logging because of warming temperatures in the winter. You can also think, how would this, this warming, how would this affect um, uh, plant and animal species, but animal species like the American martin that relies on fluffy cold snow, uh, or fluffy, uh, fluffy snow. If we don't have enough cold and we have more rain coming, it is not conducive to the habitat conditions that that species needs. Here's another cultural practice. I think this is the last one. Okay, what is it? Corn. Corn, corn harvesting corn. relies on what? Corn needs warmer temperatures. Place-based evidence, we're seeing uh, more frost-free seasonal seasons here. This is one that's, uh, this is place-based based on this, this uh, research. More warming in the summertime. And actually, NOAA, through the University of Iowa, is saying that northern Wisconsin is likely to benefit from climate change further in the future due to its northern location, and basically the ability to grow corn and other agricultural crops. So we'll have winners and losers. So the big so what of the GWA model, it increases awareness. That's kind of the setup, okay? And then the spike is the action by providing guidance in developing climate mitigation and adaptation responses through web resources that we provide and also field courses that we actually demonstrate how to do this in a culturally relevant way. So is this thing, does it work? All right, so we were lucky to have um, a master's uh, degrees, uh, master's student, Patty Carpenter, a U of D student, actually did her thesis on educators that went through a climate institute based on this model. And as you can see, it did increase their literacy skills, their confidence. Um, they found that it was transferable to other populations of students, uh, despite their location or culture. So in other words, it, it was able to be moved, just as our elder had predicted in the future, that it would be able to be used with other cultures. And they used the GWA model in some form with their students. Here's one of her slides from one of her, this is when she defended her master's degree, and, and she shared this with me. Um, this was the skills for teaching climate change based on the GWA model, and we see that uh, the blue is before the educators took the, the training, uh, orange is during the training, and then after the training was uh, about a half a year after the training. And you can see here that they were utilizing this methodology to teach effective, to effectively teach about climate change. So it's working, and it's fulfilling kind of the goals that we had for it when we first developed it. The outreach tools that we have to share, we have um, a web curriculum, a discovery center, and professional development climate change field courses and camps. They all include these elements. The website, which I don't know if we have time to go to, but... And you have a few minutes. Okay, let's see. I think I'll let you explore this on your own. I'll just explain. Can you heat up so I can tweet? Okay, so uh, it ha the website is the full expression of the GWA model. Um, if you go to it now, we have added a new unit within the last week called Hear the Water Speak, which it takes the place of this piece right here, otherwise it looks the same. If you look at that unit, we're still tweaking it around, we've got some spaces that need to be moved around. But we have four Ojibwa lifeways that are four seasonal lifeways of the Ojibwa that provide traditional ecological knowledge and place-based evidence of climate change. There's activity guides and ways to investigate place-based evidence of climate change in your culture. We have an investigate the science element that integrates the science from Wiki, NASA, and NOAA. A template for taking action through a what we can do uh, um, spot on the, on the logo. And then a talking circle where you can share um, your climate change projects. 
this curriculum is set up for middle to above students, so when you look at it, you'll see the activity guides are based, some of many of them are for middle school students and high school students. But the resources here, there are many resources that you'll be able to use as adult educators or examples that you can use and apply. And finally, we do um, field courses and climate camps that actually um, teach how to use the GEO model and how to develop climate mitigation and adaptation strategies that are culturally relevant. We're based at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, and these are done around the Apostle Islands area and also our tribal communities with our partners. There is a large uh, climate discovery center at the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. We get about 100,000 visitors a year. We figure about a third of those interact with the exhibit, um, and the exhibit is focused on wild rice, the story of wild rice, set up with the GWA model. So by linking place-based and scientific evidence of uh, how climate change is affecting sustainability of species and habitat conditions that support our practices in the GWAL model, we have created a culturally relevant climate change perspective that can be applied in different cultures. And you saw the examples of different places. You can maybe imagine how you could apply this in different places. And it's transferable from different cultures and locations. Hence the name, Kinkinu Wizziwe Anji Waban. This model and interpretive framework has, can be applied to lots of other different science topics to integrate qualitative and quantitative research to provoke action. So we have the interpretive framework and the GWAL model integrating place-based, traditional knowledge, and scientific research. Earth Partnership for Schools, based here at UW um, Nelson Institute at the Arboretum, I think they're now at the ERC, uh, Indigenous Arts and Sciences, is based on the GWAL model. I wrote the initial founding grant for that, and we use a GWA model, but we pose the scientific topic in watershed restoration. Okay? We're working on a new tribal leadership a partnership with University, uh, Michigan State University Extension called Tribes Lead, and it's going to integrate indigenous leadership perspectives and teaching with Western science leadership research to provoke action on leadership development. So you see how you can link these things together to make a more robust, tell more of that whole story that I was diagramming with my hands? Okay, so why do we use the interpretive model in science communication? Anybody? Because it works. Because it works. So what's the bottom line here? Okay, here's old Freeman Tillin again. Because it gives us the big so what? It provokes action. It increases awareness, but the spike is the action part. That's one thing that we don't want to forget as science communicators. We want people to do something. So we increase their awareness and we engage them through things that they value by revealing how the, whatever topic we're talking about resonates with them. We tell the whole story, the relationships, we, we, um, we tell the whole, but, uh, and, and we do this in an artistic way, a creative way that, 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 that makes sense to them, but the big so what is getting them to do something. And in doing something, they then internalize more of the information that you are giving them. So this was a quote that was given to us by Joe Rose, who's a tribal elder with the Bad River uh, Band of Lake Superior Ojibwa. And he said the Ojibwa believe that we must think seven generations ahead when making decisions for today. The cultures, all cultures share responsibility for protecting our home, the earth. We cannot eliminate all the risks that climate change presents, but we can make a difference in slowing its impacts. The culture and future life ways, uh, life ways of future generations will be affected by the choices we make. So we invite you to use this model, the interpretive framework, however you wish to make climate change come alive to the audiences that, you, that you're communicating with. So I say miigwech, thank you, and uh, I'll leave you with this kind of schematic diagram of the GWA model, how you could create your own, and take any questions. Thank you.